Director of Services Outreach at the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, Rebecca is here with us today to talk about uh, the process of getting entrance into a medical school in the United States. She's going to touch upon the resources that AANP, which is the Association of American Medical uh, College, Colleges, uh, makes available to students. And she's also going to provide you with a detailed understanding of the path to attending medical school in the United States. Before I ask Rebecca to begin, I would like to touch upon Education USA, tell you, give you a little brief of the program and the services. Education USA is the US Department of State Funded Network. It's a global program which connects over 400 advising centers spread over 1,000 countries in the world. And a group of net, uh, advisors come together to assist students and higher education aspirants like you all with your admission and application centric queries to institutions in the United States. In India, we have seven offices, education, there are seven education with your centers in the cities of Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, Hyderabad, Bangalore, uh, Ahmedabad, and uh, Mumbai. And uh, I'm your host today from the Kolkata office. At the end, I'm going to give you information about the upcoming webinar for the next Friday. And I'm going to leave you with other contact information in detail. But uh, for now, I would ask Rebecca to uh, take charge and get started with the presentation. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Just want to make sure if I could get a few yeses in the chat window. Great. So I wanted to say thank you very much to Education USA for having me here today. My role is to provide all the resources and tools that people who are interested in a career in medicine and the pathway to becoming a physician in the US and just provide them with that information um, so that they can make the best choices possible. So I'll jump right into the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, my goal is that you'll have a good overview of how medical education in the United States is organized. Um, you'll appreciate the variety of organizations that impact the education of physicians here in the United States, and also have some insights into our resources. We call ourselves AAMC or the double AMC. Um, have some insight into those resources designed to help individuals along their journey. And there certainly will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So I wanted to start with some important statistics and facts about education, medical education in the US. We have 147 accredited US medical schools. And there are actually 17 accredited Canadian medical schools. And all of those are our constituent members. And a medical school's mission may include many things. Um, it could be strictly education focused. It may have a stronger focus on research. It might be clinical care. It might be community care. And there's one thing we say uh, about medical schools in the US. If you've seen one medical school, you've seen one medical school. They are all very different. They all have a unique mission and a unique focus, a unique student population and makeup. So uh, it's just really important to know that each mission is very important and unique to the institution. The schools also vary in size, location, and that mission emphasis that I just went over. Um, we have them in rural locations and in urban centers. And class size varies. Um, some of the newer schools have smaller class size. And some of the larger ones that are attached to maybe a major urban hospital have larger sizes. Um, just in terms of facts and figures, um, in 2016-17, there were 51,129 applicants to the US medical schools. Um, and of those, 21,000, just over 21,000 matriculated actually went to school. Um, the number of acceptances was a little larger, but some people received multiple acceptances. But actually, there were 20, just over 21,000 who had a seat in medical school at the beginning of the year. And of that 21,140 matriculants had legal residents not in the United States. In the US, students pay for their education. Um, and it is expensive. The average debt for 2015 students was about 190,000 US dollars. So that's after their four years of medical school. 
I'm going to go over a few important abbreviations that you may hear me use and that are common um, in the U.S. medical education system. Pre-med um, or pre-medical, that's college level. Um, that is before you get into medical school and after high school. It's kind of an in-between. There's the undergraduate medical education, and that's actually the four years of attending medical school. There's graduate medical education, and that's the four years after medical school when you're doing your residency program or your graduate work in a focused area of concentration, like radiology, pediatrics. And then there's continuing medical education, or CME. And that's what you do after you have become a physician and passed your licensing exams as you stay certified in your profession. And each profession has continuing medical education. So some more important abbreviations, and these are some of the organizations that we work with. Of course, there's AAMC, which is us. There's the American Board of Medical Specialties, and that's a group that deals with physicians in practice. There's the Accreditation Council for CME, and those are the folks that accredit programs for the, for the continued licensure of physicians. There's the Accreditation Council for GME, and that deals with graduate medical education, or as we call it here in, in the States, residency. Um, the Federation of State Medical Boards. Um, LCME, the Liaison Committee for Medical Education, that is the group that accredits medical schools in the U.S. NBME, of, that's the National Board of Medical Examiners, and those are the folks who um, do the USMLE testing, which is the licensure test that medical students take um, prior to becoming a physician. Obviously, the U.S. Department of Education, which oversees many of the undergraduate or pre-med. And the USMLE is the United States Medical Licensing Exam, which is what you need to pass um, in order to become a licensed physician to practice. So lots of abbreviations um, and lots of groups that we work with hand in hand. So our role specifically is to work with all the medical schools, the teaching hospitals that are connected to medical schools, and the deans, faculty, residents, and students at each medical school. As I mentioned, the LCME, it accredits all the educational programs leading to an MD degree in the US. And the GME accredits those residency programs and fellowships, again, the post-medical school. The AACME, again, accredits programs that deliver continuing medical education for physicians as they continue to stay up to date on all that's going on in their practice area. And the USMLE, it's required licensing, um, sponsored by those two organizations. And you take it in various steps while you're in medical school, um, USMLE Step 1, Step 2, and Step 3. And then the FSMB, um, that works with all the state and territory licensing boards within the US so that physicians are licensed to practice um, once they have passed the USMLE. So here's kind of an overview of the flow of medical education in the United States. Um, we have what we call undergraduate medical education, or the medical pre-meds, which is um, after high school, after K through 12, the students go to undergraduate, and they spend approximately four years in an undergraduate program. Then they move on to medical school, which is a four-year program typically. Then after medical school, it's residency um, in the specialty of their choice, fellowships, and then move into practice. So I'm going to talk about each one of these areas in a little bit more depth. Um, so pre-medical or college, we call it. So students complete K grades K through 12 before attending a college or university. And while they're attending a college or university, they may select any field of study. But most medical schools that they'll be applying to are looking for some sort of foundation in the sciences and the humanities to prepare them for medical school. Uh, most students during their time in pre-med or in college have worked with a physician to ensure that they understand the challenges and the rewards of medicine. Um, we call this shadowing here in the United States. And they will complete an application to um, medical school in the year prior to starting medical school. 
So people this year in the month of May will start their application and submit it during June, July, and August typically. And they will be looking to start medical school in the fall of 2018. So they will do their application this year in 2017 with looking to start medical school in the fall of 2018. And again, the U.S. Department of Education oversees university accreditation for these college and undergrad, as we call them, in, including um, the LCME. So I wanted to go over a couple of quick services uh, that we offer to help folks on this journey. We have some free resources, and um, they're also also low-cost resources. But we have Aspiring Docs blog and other resources, including fact sheets. We actually have a fact sheet for um, international students. So this um, basically is a blog where students talk about their experiences. We have actually pre-meds, medical students, and residents who share their stories with us. And again, fact sheets, you know, how do I uh, apply as an international student and, and other resources. We also have the Medical School Admission Requirements Database. Um, this actually is all the information you would want to know about each medical school. We reach out to the medical school admissions personnel every year and update the information. This includes information about the prerequisites they would require for entering their school. It talks about the mission of the school, information about faculty, the student makeup of, of, that, of that school. And in addition, it also indicates whether the school accepts international applicants or not. Um, not all of the schools in the U.S. accept them. There are some schools that only accept in-state applicants. Um, so each school is different. So the medical school admission requirements will tell you if a school accepts international students. Next is the medical college admission test. Um, that is a test that is required by almost every school in the U.S. Um, it is a test that folks have to um, schedule and sit for, and then the, the scores um, are reported to the schools um, when you apply. Um, it's something you can take more than one time, um, but you do have to schedule it, and it's only given in select locations. On our website, we list all of the international testing centers and dates um, that are available. Um, Next is the American Medical School Application Service. We call that AMCAS. Uh, that is actually the um, one service where you would submit your application for all medical schools in the US. The only exception being the state of Texas has its own application system for state-run schools, and there are seven of those. Um, so that's a separate application system. And finally, we have something called FIRST, Financial Information Resources, Services, and Tools. This is to help folks manage their educational debt, also um, just manage their finances. Um, so we have that resource for folks as well. Um, and all of the information and additional resources are available on our website, um, which I've included here. So in terms of medical students, or excuse me, medical school, which we call undergraduate medical education, um, all students in medical school must complete certain requirements to get into medical school. So that's part of the application process. They have to complete four years of college, and most take the MCAT. Many have had some sort of healthcare-related experience. They have to write an essay, and they have to get letters of evaluation or recommendation. Um, from either uh, faculty they have dealt with or um, people they have worked with. Um, and our medical schools look at both the academic and the personal characteristics of applicants, and they consider them in light of the school's mission and how they feel that um, those two things would work well together. Is, is this person a good fit for our school? Um, like I mentioned earlier, medical school is typically four years in length. Um, and there are some programs that have a combined MD-PhD program, which are more research focused. They're also um, more lengthy. And as I mentioned earlier, the LCME accredits the medical education programs at all 147 medical schools at least every eight years. So it's on a rolling basis that they do this. But they do go back and look at those schools um, periodically to make sure that they are up to the standards that have been set. 
So here are some of the uh, services that we offer for medical students. Um, we offer careers in medicine. This is a site that has some self-assessments. That's to help you determine which sort of specialty you might be interested in going into. We also have lists of salaries and things like that. So you can see by specialty what um, the salary projections are and based on surveys that we've done. And that is free to US medical students in any of our medical schools. There is a fee if you want to subscribe to Careers in Medicine for international students. Um, the Global Health Learning Opportunities, or GLOW, as you can see, we like our acronyms. Um, that is um, a system I'll talk about in a little more detail because um, that may have um, the, the most um, interest for you. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, but that's um, away um, rotation opportunities um, for students. In the U.S., we have something similar for those away electives called Visiting Student Application Service, or VSAS. And then once you're ready to enter your residency, once you're getting to the end of medical school, we have ARIS, the Electronic Residency Application Service. And that is for folks to, it's sort of similar to AMCAS in that you submit your application with you know, a letter, your letters of recommendation. Um, you have your grades and, and USMLE test scores in there. Um, and then it's sent to all of the residency programs in the US. And then you are matched to one. Um, to continue your education in your specialized area. We, again, we also have FIRST. There's even more information for medical students. Um, for students in the U.S., this is the time where the debt really um, rises and they incur more of it. So we have information um, for the students about you know, repaying, repaying that debt, um, loan forgiveness programs, and, and resources and scholarships and things like that. So. Um, that's a little bit about um, medical school and the resources we have. And again, all of the information can be found on our website. So I, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the GLOW program. And um, this was developed um, a few years back. Um, it hasn't been in existence too long, but it's been very successful. And the goal is to be transactional, transformational, and transnational. So we have student services that include elective offerings. It's a web-based application. Um, we do provide institutional training. Um, there are cross-cultural tools. We have health and safety resources. Um, there's housing assistance. In addition to study abroad resources, and um, there's an evaluation to the program, and actually some alumni status um, of folks who have been through the program. Um, for the institutions that participate, they share, they have the opportunity to share their curriculum and best practices. Um, they're constantly setting benchmarks. Um, there are also conference presentations that are done, and some of the institutions are engaged in joint research. There's publications and working groups. Um, we also have an assessment and evaluation for the institutions that participate, and continuing medical education is sometimes offered through these programs. So the affiliations that we've developed include things like alumni networks. There are associations and organizations. Um, we're looking at scholarship and funding sources for this. Um, there are some NGOs um, that participate and hospitals as well. Um, we have some institutional experience providers, um, ministries of health, ministries of higher education. So that's kind of an overview of you know the system and kind of glow and, and how it operates. So the goal is really facilitating global health education. And so our hope is that we both the home institutions, the host institutions, and the students will all benefit from this process. You know, for the home institution, um, they get their student access. They can endorse a student application. They verify the credentials. They can also track their students who are in the program. And they can grant credit for the elective. Um, for a host institution, it helps them organize the offerings they may have. And they can customize the requirements for applicants. It helps streamline the process for folks who want to um, kind of do these away electives. Um, and it helps them establish student caliber for what they're expecting of students who are part of the program. Um, and we ask them to complete a post-elective evaluation of how everything went so that we can improve the program. For the student, 
it provides a centralized source of you know where to go for these away electives um, it eliminates duplicate application processing so they only have to fill out one application and it increases the transparency of the mobility of students um, it also validates the quality of the opportunity um, because we do vet these organizations with the institutions that want to work with us so the GLOW Collaborative is growing. Um, in 2013 is when we piloted this, and we had 24 institutions in 13 countries. And as of December of 2016, we had 113 institutions in 42 countries, and it's continuing to grow. Um, the program actually offers over 1,300 electives, and 300 students have completed electives in the program. So here's a screenshot. My apologies if it's kind of tiny. Um, I tried to get as much in as possible so you can kind of see what's available. So when you go into the GLOW system and you're, and you're searching, you can search for your electives by the institution name or an elective name, the location, the month it's offered, the type of elective it is, an estimated cost, the specialty, if there's any special language you're looking for, and the duration, um, you know, how long this elective Will, will be going. So these are some of the options that you have when you're when you're looking at the electives that are offered. So there are fees, and the fees I'm going to describe here are in U.S. dollars. Um, there's a $45 application fee, which is payable through PayPal. Um, I also wanted to let you know that institutions can charge a processing or tuition fee. Um, that that's up to each institution. Um, but here are some student scholarship and funding ideas that um, we've heard that others use, have used or that you may want to consider. Um, we do have a link to scholarship sites and funding ideas on our website. Um, GLOW is also partnered with CFHI and, and provides partial scholarships. Um, institutions are encouraged to raise funds from alumni who may have also been through the program. And then some host institutions charge tuition and use the funds for the home institution scholarships. So that's what some of the tuition fees may be going to. So is your faculty of medicine in the GLOW Collaborative? Um, I have the website up here on the screen. And also I have, um, if you click on attending medical school, under that is GLOW. Um, and if you go to the GLOW page, you'll see a link for participating institutions. And you can see the host and the home institutions and search for them. And so some people have said to me, well, what if my institution isn't there? Well, if you have an interest in having your institution participate, if you know um, who might be responsible for making those decisions at the institution, um, you can let them know about this. Or you can email GLOW, it's G-H-L-O, at A-A-M-C dot org, and say, I'm very interested in my institution participating. Could you reach out to them and, and see if there's a possibility for us to do so? So um, it, it's very easy for the inquiry to get started, and it's certainly easy for you to look up and see if your faculty of medicine is part of the collaborative currently. So moving on from medical school, once you've completed medical school, once you've graduated, once you've taken your USMLE, your licensing exam, um, you move on to residency and fellowship, or what we call graduate medical education. So while you're in medical school, you're going to learn about different specialties. And in the final year of medical school, these students are going to apply to specific residency programs anywhere in the USA. And they do that through that ERA system, the Electronic Residency Application Service. Um, in medical school, they'll complete and pass two of the three parts of the USMLE. So they'll have most of that completed. There is a step three um, to the USMLE. And the third part of USMLE is typically completed after your first year of graduate medical education. And once you pass that, you can then apply for state licenses to practice. Um, and licenses vary from state to state in the US. Um, each state regulates um, its own licensed physicians. So residency can last anywhere from three to seven years or longer. It depends on the specialty you choose. You know, neurosurgery is um, a very intensive, surger surgically focused 
residency, and that is one of the longer ones. So um, we do have lists on our website about of approximations of how long a residency program might last. And as I mentioned earlier, the ACGME accredits these programs and again does so on a rolling basis where they go back um, every number of years and just make sure that the programs are following the guidelines and meeting the required standards um, that have been set. So moving on to practice, um, so our physicians in the U.S. work in a variety of settings. Um, it could be a rural community, it could be a city. Um, many work in academics, so many of them, once they finish their residency, might go back to teaching. Um, there are many physicians who work in government roles um, and in nonprofit. I will tell you that at our organization, the AAMC, we have a number of physicians on staff. Our, um, our president and CEO is a physician, as is our um, executive vice president, and we have many physicians on staff. Um, I myself am not a physician. I am a communication marketer by trade, um, but uh, I began my career working in medical publishing um, and then have, have ended up here. So while we do have experts in various areas, we, we do have MDs on staff and MD PhDs. Um, one thing about physicians is they have to be lifelong learners. Uh, medicine moves at an incredibly fast pace, and that's one reason for the CME. Um, so they have to constantly recertify, retrain, um, and stay up to speed. So you have to want to be a lifelong learner if you want to be in the practice of medicine. Um, as I mentioned, they become certified in their specialties after they complete their residency training, and they pass a comprehensive exam for that. Um, so one thing, um, people think, oh, well, I take one exam, like with the MCAT, to get in. No, you'll be taking exams continually um, to keep certified and to keep a pace with um, what's going on in medicine. Um, so they also must main, maintain the specialty certification. Um, uh, it's called maintenance of certification process. And that's done through the American Board of uh, Medical Specialists that I had mentioned earlier. And so they also must maintain a state license through the CME requirements in the federal law. So that's the that's the um, I'm going to wrap up here um, with some online resources for you. Um, you can visit our website at any time. Um, amc.org slash backslash students. It will link you to the various um, path, uh, st stages along the path. So anything from being pre-medical school to um, pre-medical school to medical school to residency and fellowship. Um, in social media, we're very active on social media, um, and so some general accounts. If you're in that pre-med, not in medical school yet um, phase, I would say that um, follow, you can follow us on Twitter. We also have a Facebook page. We also have specific accounts for medical students um, uh, on Twitter and on Facebook. And then in general, we have an AAMC Today account um, and a general Facebook account. So that's kind of, um, especially in the pre-med space, we are very active on social media. Um, and we certainly will answer questions there. We post news and information there. Um, so that, I just wanted to give folks some online resources um, that, that might help them or guide them or direct them. So with that, uh, I'm going to end the formal presentation portion. And, um, and I'm just going to ask how we would like to do the question portion. Um, do you want me to go through the questions and, and answer the ones, um, or will someone read them out? Right. Um. Thank you, Rebecca, for that extremely informative session. I mean, medicine turns out to be, it happens to be an area around which we've seen many people have a lot of questions and doubts. And it's also sort of complicated to understand for uh, many of our students. So uh, the information uh, provided by you was extremely beneficial, I would think. And the resources, more than anything else, were very beneficial. Um, now I would request students to start typing their questions on the chat section. And I will then pull them out for Rebecca to answer them as we go along the session. And you can take them one at a time, Rebecca. So I will actually pull out the questions for you. You can just sure. focus on answering them. OK.
So we have a question that's how about MD PhD programs? Yes, we do have, there are schools that offer a combined MD PhD program. You definitely have to apply for those and you do that through the AMCAS, the application system that I had mentioned earlier. Um, we do have some information and we have, first of all, we have a database that shows where these programs are. So, um, so again, if you go onto our website and you search on MD PhD program on the site, it'll pull that up for you. We also have some fact sheets that talk about the process. Um, I will say this, um, for MD PhD programs, the application has some more sections and is a little more intense. Um, the standard AMCAS application has nine sections and um, the MD PhD program requires additional because it's going to focus a little bit more on research. So you'll have more, um, you might have a second essay to write for that. So um, it, it, it's a little more intense. I will also say that those are very, even more competitive. Um, so um, you, you just want to make sure that you have a really great application if you're interested in that. And also you want to check and see that the school um, um, that has the MD PhD program will accept international students. Um, again, you can find that information in the MSAR. You can also go to each school's web page individually, um, but the MSAR actually compiles that information for you so you can go online in one database and find all of the answers because um, the folks in the admissions office are the ones who provide us with that information every, and we update it every year. Um, I thought I saw another question, it just kind of went away, are there scholarships available? Um, are more scholarships available for this than for MD? In terms of the MD PhD program, um, I can let you know that um, because the schools are looking for researchers, there is more scholarship awarded. Um, I, I cannot speak exactly to whether scholarship is awarded to U.S. only versus international students. Again, that would be something that's unique to each um, institution. So you'd probably want to contact the admissions office and ask that question. How long does the pre-medical school last? So most pre-med programs are four-year programs. So um, there, there may be a few accelerated programs, but there aren't that many. And typically what happens um, is that a student in the pre-med program will um, focus on biology or focus on biochemistry or have, an, have some sort of science, technology, engineering, or math or STEM um, focus or degree from their undergraduate program. That's not to say that those are the only degrees. Um, there was a music major that was accepted um, last year because schools are looking for, um, they're looking for diversity. Um, they're looking for people that bring all sorts of uh, wonderful things to their class and makeup. They're, they're looking to diversify the class. But typically the pre-med lasts four years and the focus again is typically on scientific courses, biology, biochemistry, things like that. Okay, the next question is, can an international student with a bachelor's degree transfer to a medical school in the U.S. and get admission to medical school? Um, I'm going to assume a bachelor's degree comes from your home institution in your home country. Um, each school is different. Um, so again, I'm going to suggest that you either go to the MSAR or check out each school's um, web page with regard to that because every school requires something a little bit different. Um, if it was, I will tell you this, um, when you apply using the AMCAS system, AMCAS does not accept foreign transcripts um, because we are not able to verify them. So um, if you have um, schoolwork done at an international institution that has, um, that is affiliated with a U.S. school, those would be accepted. Or if you have done study abroad in the U.S. Um, and have transcripts from your time there um, at that, that school, those would be accepted. How can I get into the pre-medical school? So um, just to clarify, um, they're not technically called pre-medical schools. They're just called undergraduate institutions in the U.S. And that's everything from Yale University in the Northeast to Stanford out on the West Coast 
to um, my alma mater, which is Towson State University, a four-year program. Um, so it, it can, it's not necessarily a pre-medical school. It's an undergraduate school where you can major in anything from business, science, finance, communications, but the people who go to the institution definitely tend to focus on getting their bachelors in an area like the sciences or the humanities. So the next question for a student who has already completed years in medical schools, is there a way to transfer to take the MCAT directly without doing a four-year bachelor's? Um, again, this is going to be dependent on each medical school. Um, you can take the MCAT exam. Um, anyone who has the intention to attend a medical school um, in the U.S. can take the MCAT exam. We do have a listing of international locations where it is offered and dates where it is offered, um, which is on our website. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look there. Um, and, and I'm assuming when you mean already completed years in medical school outside of the U.S. Um, again, um, if it's a foreign school, the, um, we don't accept the foreign transcripts. And you might have to contact each medical school just to determine what their requirements are if you have a bachelor's degree from a foreign institution, a non-U.S. institution. But yes, you can, can apply without taking. So are there pre-med courses offered at universities or you just or you specialize in biology or chemistry? Um, some universities do offer a pre-med course. Um, some of our universities have advisors that focus strictly on pre-med. Others focus on pre-health. That includes everything um, here in the U.S. from nursing to occupational therapy to optometry to athletic training. So we have advisors who will help you. Um, the pre-med courses, because the medical schools are now starting to look for um, folks who have, you know, bring much more diversity, and that includes academic diversity. So someone who has a foundation in some of the sciences is great, um, but someone who has a marketing degree might be equally as interesting to the schools. So um, you don't have to specialize in biology or chemistry, but most schools do do have, most medical schools do have prerequisites in terms of you need to have two full semesters of biology or one semester of chemistry and they will list those on their website. We also include all of those prerequisites in the MSAR database. So again, you don't have to specialize in those areas, but more than likely you will need to have taken science courses and done well in them so that it shows that you have an aptitude for the science. So the next question is, how about the scholarships for U.S. citizens, because I am one. So um, we do have databases on our website um, that talk about scholarship. Um, scholarship for undergraduate education, that's before you get to the medical school, um, there's more available. Um, in terms of medical school scholarships, there's less of that available. Um, scholarships and funding, like I said, in the U.S., most students take out loans to pay for their medical school, um, but there are scholarships available also for U.S. citizens. There are things called loan forgiveness and loan repayment programs. Um, one of the loan forgiveness, if you will, is if you decide to enter the military in the U.S., um, our military has a medical school, and so if you attend that medical school and then commit years of service to the military, you you have um, you know you don't have any medical school costs for that. There are also loan forgiveness programs in where after medical school, if you decide to go to a rural or underserved area, some of your debt may be forgiven. And there's a list of those debt forgiveness plans on our website. So question, is there a possibility for a general physician in Algeria to continue residency in the U.S.? Um, so I... Mm, so that would be done uh, through the ARIS um, system, 
And my suggestion would be um, to contact ARIS to ask them about that because that's very, very specific and I, I don't, I honestly don't have an answer for it. Um, but you can email the ARIS program about that question. It's ARIS, E-R-A-S, at AAMC.org. Um, and one of my colleagues um, will be answering that question for you. So I'm sorry I don't have it um, specific to that though. Okay, I was asked to type it out, so I just put that in the chat in terms of connecting to um, ARIS. So the next question, how can I get a scholarship and how much would it cost to go from undergraduate to training in a residency? So um, like I mentioned, we have a list of scholarships um, on our website um, and links to scholarship information. Um, I'm going to type into the chat where you would find that on our website. So let me do that real quick. Um, that resource I mentioned first, financial information, resources, services, and tools, um, they have links to all of those scholarships. Um, so the, And then the second part is how much would it cost to go from undergrad to training in a residency? So um, once you complete your undergraduate medical education and then into residency in the U.S., um, you, residency is when you start to receive um, a base salary um, for the work you are doing. So um, on average, um, a U.S. Um, medical student, um, for those that need to um, get financial assistance or take out loans, accumulates a 190,000 U.S. dollars in debt, and that's for the four-year period. That includes everything, so I just want to be clear. That's not just tuition. That's tuition, that's lab fees, that's textbooks. Um, that also includes housing and residency and, and food. And you know, so it's in, in terms of it's one hundred and ninety thousand dollars for them to go to medical school and then have basic needs like rent, um, food, and things like that. So I think that I, I think I accidentally closed it. It was a question about molecular and cellular biology. So if we could bring that one back up really quick. How is molecular and cell biology as an undergraduate major for med school? Um, I, I think, well, let me say this, you know, that's sciences. So I think that that will certainly look, be looked favorably upon in terms of the um, application committee, the admissions committee, taking a look at your scientific background and knowledge. Um, so I hope that if, that if that's what you mean, how do admissions committees look at those as undergraduate majors? Um, I will say this, you know, medical schools are also looking for how well-rounded you are as an individual. So, so you know, make sure you're thinking about GPA, um, make sure you're thinking about experiences you've had. They're looking for characteristics like leadership, um, you know, teamwork, things like that. So. Um, beyond the scientific knowledge, which you absolutely need, are, you know, some of the other skills, that, um, you know, empathy and, um, and working with others. So um, I would think that molecular and cell biology um, would be well received by medical schools. Um, again, it's scientific in nature and um, that's something that's obviously very important in terms of um, medical scholarship. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I I believe I keep hitting that delete button too fast. It was a USMLE Step 1 question. Okay. Can I pass USMLE Step 1 test in Europe instead of Egypt since it's closer to me? Um, I'm not as familiar with USMLE. Um, I, I don't know if you can take it elsewhere. Uh, I know for MCAT, you can take the MCAT exam in whatever location you choose. You don't have to be in a home country or anything like that. So I might go to, to the website or, you know, this is what I would do. I would Google USMLE um, and look for the folks that administer the test 
and see if they have any special requirements about where to take the test. I, I'm not as familiar with that test. I, I know a lot about the MCAT because um, I have lived through that the past four years. And unfortunately, I don't know as much about the USMLE Step 1, but I would go to the website and see if they have any special requirements or restrictions um, in terms of where you take the test. Uh, I'm not sure you covered this, but do you pay a fee to complete your residency? So you pay a fee to apply for residency. Um, and I'm just going to look to the side really quickly um, because I wrote it down earlier. Um, so the fee for the residency, it's $99 per program you are interested in applying to. So um, when you do the ERAS, e um, application, it will be nine, and that's for uh, the first 10, 10 residency programs you're interested in. After that, it's a sliding scale, um, and it goes down a little bit per residency program. And that, again, is in US dollars. I'm currently eligible to apply to medical school, but it is hard to identify the international student friendly medical schools. Um, how can that be done? So in the MSAR, um, in the MSAR database, we, um, we ask the schools that do accept international students. Um, and, they, and that will be indicated in the MSAR database. So I'll type in the URL about where you can get more information about the MSAR. So I'm doing that real quick right now. Um, so that's a subscription-based product. Um, just so that you know, you can subscribe to it for a year, and I believe the cost is $29, 29 US dollars. You can also reach out to each individual school or go to their website. I can tell you this, um, Boston University in Boston, Massachusetts definitely accepts international students. Although the number of international students accepted across the US in general is a low number. Uh, type the link to scholarships. Um, yes, I can do that. It's going to take me a minute. So um, I will do that toward the end. Um, and I will try to, on the sly, I'm going to try to open up two browser windows. And um, I'm going to keep talking. Um, and if you want to put up another question, I'm going to look for it really quick. And um, But I'm happy to answer. So what is the average cost for an MD program? Um, again, um, it varies. Um, and in looking at the four years of um, education required, um, as I mentioned, the average debt or the average loans that the US students take out to, for their programs is 190000 for the four years. Again, that, that includes all of their costs in addition to you know rent and food and things like that. Um, each program is, is different and the costs vary. Um, if it's a private uh, medical school, the costs are going to be higher. Obviously, if it's a public school, um, the costs will be lower, so uh, the, the tuition costs. Um, that information is also provided in the MSAR. Um, we ask them for the cost of their program, so that's in the MSAR as well. So the next question, is there an exam that we need to pass to get a degree in English since we're not from the US? Um, well, there isn't a specific exam tailored just for English or for a degree in English. However, um, part of the MCAT exam, and there are four pieces to the MCAT exam, there are um, three um, scientific portions of the exam, and then there's one, um, it used to be called verbal reasoning. Um, and it's clinical analysis and reasoning skills. And basically, it's um, reading passages and then answering questions based on the information in the passages um, to, to show a um, the fluency in the English language and understanding and logical reasoning. So while there's no um, need to get a degree in, in English, um, there will be a portion of the MCAT exam that certainly takes into account your ability to read in English, interpret, analyze, and um, 
deduce from logic um, answers to questions. Um, but there's nothing specifically you have to read for it in advance. I'm a U.S. citizen currently residing in India. I'm applying from um, from India for the undergrad program first. Is there any FAFSA available for med school funding? Um, I, I don't believe there's FAFSA funding available for med school. Um, I believe FAFSA is strictly for undergraduate. Um, but if you'd like, I'm going to type in the email that you can ask that question to. And um, my lovely colleague, Julie, who answers that, will be happy to help you. I also found that list of scholarships um, um, on our website. I'm going to apologize in advance. It's a very long URL. Um, but this, um, this is a listing of scholarships, um, loan forgiveness, um, repayment programs um, that we have pulled together. So I just um, put that URL into the chat. Uh, functionality as well. Um, are there financial programs that allow non-U.S. citizens to get a loan for financing um, medical school uh, in the U.S.? Um, I'm not aware of any, um, to be honest with you. Uh, I would, however, suggest taking a look at that scholarship and loan list to see. Um, you might also want to contact each school individually or, again, check in the MSAR to see what financial programs that they offer to international students should you be accepted because each school may have something that they offer um, students, but that, that's certainly on a school-by-school -school basis. So the next question, I'm a medical student in Algeria, and I want to know what steps I should take at the end of my education to join GME in the U.S. So um, I'm going to let you know that you should probably go to the ARIS website, and again, I'm going to type in um, the, e or the address for that. Um, it's going to give you information in terms of international students um, uh, and applying to residency programs in the U.S. So is there a question, is there any such thing as a full ride scholarship for U.S. students for medical school? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I, I will say that there could be programs, um, well, I'll say this. I read a book recently called um, Black Man in a White Coat, um, and it, it was about um, an African-American individual who went to school at Duke. And I believe in the book he mentioned that Duke um, provided a scholarship for his education. Um, and, I, and I believe it was full ride, but uh, I can't remember exactly. Um, so it, it depends on the school, um, and it depends on kind of their mission. Um, on, in the MSAR, it'll tell you again if they offer um, full scholarships for the full four years. Um, it might be partial scholarships for years, and again, each school is different. Um, so I would check with each school. Um, also check our, um, uh, especially for a particular medical school, um, if it's a full ride scholarship, that's going to be unique to the school itself and not necessarily in a more generalized open database of scholarships. So the question is, can you apply for a pharmaceutical residency if you have a farm, a PhD in pharmacy? Um, so actually, we have um, another organization that deals with um, phar pharmacy. Um, and I'm going to, while I'm sitting here talking to you, um, type that into my browser and take a look. Type that into my browser and take a look. 
because um, pharmacy schools because um, they have a special residency um, program and um, I'm just gonna take a look here yeah um, they have a very long acronym kind of like ours so let me So there are, there are a number of those. Um, so the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. Um, let me just. I, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna give that resource. I'm gonna type that in. So um, I'm just gonna put that in the URL. I would check with them. Um, they manage the pharmacy residencies in the U.S. I, I'm not aware of their. Um, if they have any specialized programs or anything like that, but um, that, that's what I would suggest. So question, what if a doctor from a foreign country wanted to work in the U.S.? Will they have to pass another exam to prove that they are capable of it? Um, so in the United States, in order to work um, as a physician, you, I, I believe, and it's different state by state you have to well you have to pass the licensing the USMLE um, and then each state will um, have some additional licensing that you need to pass so it depends on what state you're interested in um, and each state board of medical licensing uh, I, I believe I, I, I had that um, um, that group earlier this Mer American State Board of Licensing Medical Licensors I can't remember the exact you um, acronym um, but each state is different so yes they will more than likely need to pass the USMLE and then any state licensing and can getting a Fulbright scholarship help in any way for medical school so um, I, I don't know I mean I, I would think that every every school is different um, if you've received a Fulbright, Fulbright scholarship um, there's a reason obviously um, it was received um, one of the things that you can put in your medical school application are work activities and awards um, so you can mention that in your application um, you also have the opportunity to write an essay um, for medical school um, in your application and um, that would be an opportunity to talk about the Fulbright scholarship um, you know how you went about getting it um, what you did that kind of thing um, or how getting that scholarship impacted you or, or helped you along the way so um, you know you do have the opportunity to mention awards and work and activities um, in your application uh, all right that was a big bunch of questions which came our way thank you Becky for being so patient and answering all of them. Uh, I'm so glad to see that questions have, students have those many questions to ask. Uh, the sessions actually turned out to be uh, so effective because of Becky's participation and also because of the quest. students who are so proactive and who asked us all of those questions. But right now we are pressed for time. We just have two more minutes and uh, we can't take any more questions. If you want to follow up, maybe you can get in touch with Becky later or another colleague of hers for any additional concerns. Uh, for students who want to know more about how Fulbright can help you get your make your way to a medical school, I would suggest that you get in touch with the Fulbright Commission in your region and they will be able to help you uh, find answer to that, that question. And for the rest of you who are not aware of Education USA or haven't used our services before, I would strongly recommend that you look us up on the web and contact a center closest to you for any concerns regarding U.S. higher education that you might have. With this, I would like to draw this session to a close. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. The coming week, we are discussing a webinar which is for women undergraduate students in particular, and it's about a scholarship which Agnes Scott College is making available to you. So for those of you who find that befitting, do remember to join us the coming week. With this, I would like to draw this to a close. Thanks and goodbye.